Welcome to the second part of the debate on the Treaty of Trianon. Uh, the panelists of the debate are Mr. Bogdan Goralczyk from the University of Warsaw, uh, Mr. Radislav Sabada from Metropolitan University Prague, and Mr. Miklos Sani from Center for Social and Economic Research. And um, when I was reading an extremely interesting, um, profound analysis made by Roman Holtz in his book entitled Tranon, Triumph and Disaster, uh, yes, exactly this book, <laughs> I came across uh, his insight into history. And it's really interesting. He believes that history is not an American highway where we will set the cruise control and we know exactly how long it will take us to get from point A to point B. History is also not Slovak highway, which we will get to point B, but we do not know how, and when we do not know how it will take us. <laughs> However, history is a fourth category road with holes, detours and blind alleys. Of course, we are drivers and we think we know the direction, but we are still subordinate to road signs, communication and the road works. And we are dependent on vehicles, animals on the road, uh, other road users uh, and our own mistakes like in our lives. Therefore, Trianon should not be understood, he says, as a historical regularity uh, to which we have measured thanks to something indicated as the logic of history. However, I believe that perhaps we should not see the logic in the historical memory uh, propagated by the current Hungarian government today but we should first of all look into other sources, sources of decisions made at that time. In the first part of the debate, uh, two months ago, we discussed ethnic and political aspects. And I would like to start today's debate with a short economic and social analysis of Central Europe in not just 20th century. So Mr. Miklos Sani, what were the historical determinants of the economic development action in uh, Central Europe? Well, um, the area uh, has some special names. Uh, the Germans uh, call uh, our region Middle Europa. So uh, very early, uh, the uh, historians uh, and other people also realized that uh, Central European uh, countries uh, differ from those archetype models of uh, capitalism, archetype models of uh, society, which uh, is uh, uh, dominant in uh, more Western parts of, uh, of Europe. Of course, there are also uh, other uh, development models in Russia, in Turkey, and even in uh, remote uh, continents, still uh, very much different ones. What I would like to highlight is that uh, uh, all types of, uh, of direct comparisons with uh, some ideal uh, models of development like the British or the German will uh, produce uh, misunderstandings. So the Central European uh, region has its own historical uh, background, uh, uh, social, political, and economic development patterns, uh, which is not identical with the masterpiece, uh, which is uh, uh, dominating uh, the textbooks mainly. So therefore, uh, what we see in the economies uh, of Central Europe is, uh, is also a kind of uh, mixture of uh, various bigger regions' impacts. Um, historically, uh, uh, this is uh, also uh, uh, evident. Today. So it is uh, perhaps uh, 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 more interesting to talk about the most current uh, development patterns, 
what we see in Hungary, uh, but also uh, very much uh, in the other Central European countries, the turning uh, from the uh, Western model of development that uh, was uh, followed for at least uh, uh, 10 years, 15 years after the transition started in 1990. So there is a, a turn away from uh, this uh, uh, model. I would uh, this current day uh, development model label as the competition state model, competition in politics, competition in uh, the economy. Uh, this was the pattern that uh, uh, our countries in the region following uh, uh, the Western uh, ideal uh, wanted to introduce. However, uh, it uh, became uh, quite evident very soon that uh, uh, the historical institutions of this model, which is uh, uh, clearly seen uh, in Western European countries, uh, cannot be uh, duplicated or imitated uh, uh, without uh, any uh, restriction in the region. So uh, the 100, 200 years development pattern of France, for example, cannot be spared. So uh, those institutions that uh, we established, the regions, uh, countries established, uh, did not work uh, uh, in that proper manner uh, that uh, the Western uh, development uh, model uh, suggested. In the economy, this uh, has also uh, consequences. Uh, what I think uh, is crucial is that uh, competition is not the main feature that uh, uh, these societies, governments, and the people in the region uh, would like to see. Uh, because of the historical uh, patterns, uh, there is room for rent and rent seeking, uh, and uh, the societies treat uh, rent seeking as a normal feature the close connection of politics and economy, uh, the lack of separation of these uh, two areas uh, is also a, a common feature and uh, nobody is very much surprised that uh, this happens. This is absolutely uh, contrary to the ideal type. I mean, uh, of course, uh, in all uh, Western European countries, even in the United States and elsewhere, the liberal, uh, 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 political and economic uh, uh, setups also feature close ties between uh, the politics and economics, of course. But there is a strong institutional and social control over these uh, linkages. So what is uh, weak in our countries in Central, Central Europe is the control over these uh, issues. Um, unfortunately, uh, there is, uh, and the problem is really that uh, uh, the society, uh, the people uh, do not really understand the necessity, uh, the importance of this type of control. And therefore, it is very easy for our uh, governments, for some political leaders to misuse uh, this situation and reinforce uh, uh, and, and uh, increase the level of rent-seeking uh, in uh, these economies. And the society, the, the uh, people, uh, don't uh, really uh, mind very much this. Well, uh, coming back to uh, the uh, first uh, sentences uh, that I've said, uh, the Central European model uh, after the transition uh, was earmarked uh, for 10, 15 years by uh, the ideal type development patterns, and it produced uh, a, an economic development which uh, integrated the region into the global uh, labor uh, division uh, system of the world economy. And I think uh, this was a very uh, important and uh, necessary step. Uh, these countries needed uh, in new investments, uh, new inputs of uh, technologies and uh, managerial and other know-how. And uh, the easiest way of obtaining uh, these uh, factors was uh, to uh, join uh, multinational companies' uh, production networks. Um, for a good 10-15 years, uh, 
those Visegrad countries we are talking about received quite a lot of uh, foreign investments and uh, the economic growth was also fueled uh, by these investments. So uh, the beneficial impacts uh, of, uh, of this uh, uh, development became quite uh, evident and obvious. However, uh, after uh, the year 2000, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the impetus, the uh, thru thrust uh, of, uh, of multinational uh, companies uh, lost steam. And uh, this is what uh, the governments in, in the region realized, and they started to look for additional or, or uh, other uh, sources of economic growth. And uh, they also started to uh, limit uh, their uh, uh, backings, uh, limit their uh, uh, promotion of uh, uh, foreign direct investments. They also started to criticize uh, the developments. Actually, uh, there is uh, quite a lot of uh, opportunity, much room for the criticism uh, of the activity of the multinational firms because there is a very strong dependency uh, of uh, the Central European countries uh, on the multinational companies. Uh, if uh, I may make only one uh, last uh, sentence on uh, uh, this dependence, uh, I guess that uh, uh, this again uh, can be traced back to the historical development model and also maybe to the Trianon Treaty because uh, the uh, economic units that uh, uh, were created uh, after 1920 in this region were simply too small to stand alone. So uh, right after uh, the uh, Trianon tri Treaty, after the First World War, uh, these countries uh, in the region became uh, already dependent politically and also economically uh, from other countries. And this uh, story just continued uh, up till today. So this dependence, what we have now, uh, well, there was a uh, 45 years period when uh, the region uh, depended uh, from Russia, from the Soviet Union and not Germany or other Western countries, but still the dependence was there even in those years. So uh, this is a very important uh, other feature of the region that uh, Unfortunately, these countries uh, uh, are uh, not uh, suitable for uh, completely uh, independent uh, economic action. Mm -hmm. Yes, when I was listening to you, one thing came to my mind that maybe I think that each country has got own role in our whole world. <laughs> unfortunately and us but also again we can always find logic in making decisions although it does not always produce the expected results the, this was also the consequence of the uh, world war first let us remember that this um, were still the times of colonization, where after 1980, all colonies were taken away from Germany and Austria-Hungary, uh, among others in Africa or China. But um, the decisive factor, however, was the absence of any kind of outreach to the national minorities in Hungary. And uh, the 14 points made by Woodrow Wilson and the treaty provisions were uh, then to be interpreted as a meaning that the new states were primarily to be within the boundaries of the national minorities concerned. So um, maybe on uh, Mr. Uh, on what basis uh, was nationality determined in the former Austro-Hungarian Empire, Mr. Bogdan Gorajek? How could it be calculated? Uh, the statistics were in the hands of the state as it is today, but which wanted to show the largest possible number of Hungarian people. 
Well, as we remember, uh, we had uh, uh, a special treaty signed in 1867 between Hungary and Austria, or Austria and Hungary. And thereafter, we had the empire. Uh, the empire, which was uh, on the one hand, very important part of the Hungarian history, for some people, uh, including politicians today in Budapest, this was the golden era of development. Definitely, for instance, Budapest not only was created as Buda, uh, Budapest because it was separate Buda and Pesh, two separate cities, but also it was at the end of 19th century, the quickest development on the globe. Only in the first decade of 20, 20th century, a certain name of Manhattan uh, speed it up and change the leadership. So uh, this is point number one, that we had a federal state, very peculiar one. And uh, during that time, we had a liberal approach towards the economy. Mostly the, the prime ministers on both sides, uh, and especially in so-called uh, St. Stephen uh, crown of uh, Hungarian part, they were um, mostly in economic terms, liberals. However, there was an issue which emerged pretty quickly. It has appeared for the first time uh, as an important question during 1848-49 revolution when so-called uh, national issue uh, was also getting stronger and stronger with some nations inside of uh, the empire uh, intending to be independent. When our host Radmila mentioned that we are the drivers of our fate, I hesitate to say so because I will try to prove that this is vice versa, <laughs> that somebody else is driving uh, behind us and beyond us. And in this respect, during the Hung Austria-Hungarian Empire, we had uh, a good economic driving, but very bad uh, ethnic or national driving. Uh -huh. Here you have an exchange of views between two uh, members and citizens of Austria-Hungarian Empire. On the one side, Bela Grunwald, the Hungarian who wants to wipe out the Slovaks from the map. And the other side, uh, Michal Mudron. It was in the uh, 1880s, and this is a Hungarian edition with the, the four uh, up, uh, afterwards by my friend uh, uh, Ignaz Romšić, one, uh, if not the best ha uh, Hungarian historian of the 20th century. I am not uh, uh, describing him according to official light right now, because there's a great debate uh, concerning Romšić and his uh, views. And on the other side, you have uh, already mentioned Roman Holetz, uh, probably the best uh, historian of 20th century and 19th century uh, in Slovakia. As a result, we had division lines and look, we had also, as a result, Trianon. And for the Slovaks, it's a triumph. For the Hungarians, it's catastrophe. The same term, completely different meaning. It means that, first of all, we need to be careful with our ethnicity. In Hungarian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Hungarians were in minority. Only Grunwald, uh, Rakosien, uh, is, uh, is some other people 
were pressing from Hungarization, very famous Lex Aponi of 1907, uh, that uh, Hungarians prevailed. Mm. This was issue number one. Issue number two was raised quite rightly so by Miklos Sani. Uh, dependence and divisions also in an economic sense because the major cities on the Hungarian part of the St. Crown were mostly Hungarian, while Transylvania, Slovakia, uh, or upper province, as they would say, Felvidik, uh, was uh, peasants uh, and uh, the people, local people of different nations. So once again, not only ethnic issue, but also material background, which was extremely important and emerged during the Horty era between the First and the Second World War in Hungary, which brought about numerous clauses and the Jewish issue, and later on, which was described in my uh, recent book on Trianon to the Holocaust Hungarian style. So this is the issue which we need to be careful. Point number three, we have a very famous economist and sociologist of Hungarian origin, Karl Polanyi, and his very famous book around the globe, Great Transformation. I'm afraid we are repeating the, the situation because we had liberal order, and later re-emergence of nation states, na national interests, and new division lines. Because what has happened, as was described by my predecessor, Mikros Sani, after 1990, after a so-called change of the system, it was a neoliberal order when the market rules. And at least in 2008, we discovered that the neoliberal order has collapsed, that not only market rules and current pandemic right now is showing that the nation state is once again stronger, not only in Budapest or uh, Warsaw. Uh, we have somebody from Prague, so he will describe how strong is the Prime Minister of the uh, Czech Republic. Uh, however, we have a strong man. Just yesterday, I was in the Polish television discussing the first debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And what we observe, return of national interests and power politics instead of values. This is dangerous, this is a repetition, this is, this is something we know from our history and we need to be careful now. Because, and this is the last sentence of mine uh, in this round, what we discovered in the first and the second uh, decade of this century, that many uh, politicians, but also experts, also uh, the economists are describing our new model as a dependence economy or dependent model. I will give you an example. As you know, I'm, at least some of you know, that I'm dealing with Hungarian affairs and simultaneously the Chinese one. And the Chinese created the so-called uh, 16 or 17 plus one organization umbrella and the institute is located in Budapest. And it was established already 2012 in Warsaw, but the headquarters is until now in Budapest. And this institute in Budapest has discovered uh, that like it or not, without German participation, the Chinese will do nothing in this region because we are so heavily dependent on the German economy like it was during the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So 
even the Chinese discovered something which is so difficult for us to comprehend and to understand that uh, somewhat, somebody else sometimes is dominating, that uh, we are not the drivers or the made, made drivers. Maybe we are sitting in the bus instead of the car when, as you know, there's uh, many <laughs> people <laughs> sitting inside. <laughs> uh, so this is a different definition of Central Europe. We are not in the cars, we are si <laughs> sitting in the buses. And let's uh, formulate this first conclusion of mine uh, this way. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, it's quite interesting, but going back <laughs> to our Trianon and first years after Trianon, I also would like to emphasize in our discussion one um, uh, interesting point in relations between Hungary and Poland that uh, there was an event in building that those Polish-Hungarians uh, relations uh, which took place as late as 1920, namely the Hungarian Prime Minister Pal Teleki used the decision to provide military assistance to Poland at a critical moment of the Polish Bolshevik war. Why did he do that? Let us bear in mind that at that time, Hungary was obliged to demilitarize the country by treaty. So uh, Maybe he was demilitarizing this way, Hungary, sending all the armaments to the Polish Soviet war. Yes, but why, why to Polish one? It's quite interesting. Okay, so maybe uh, Miklos Horty's era, as well as the very consequences of signing the Treaty of Trianon, uh, were avoided throughout the entire period of communist Hungary. And, uh, but I, taking back to this, his role in building uh, Austro-Hungarian monarchy and his influence of the future of Hungary, he was a controversial figure, and in his power, uh, he strove primarily for a revenge. Uh, he did, it, did not accept uh, the fate of Hungary after the Treaty of Trianon, um, and fell into a nationalistic trap, what we can see also today. And Mr. Bogdan Guralczyk, could you give uh, as an idea of what was the hallmark of his almost quarter century power lasting also during World War II. What was the impact of his decisions on the negotiations during the Paris Treaty in 1947? First, uh, before we start to talk about Admiral Horty, let's uh, take the issue of uh, Pal Teleki, the twice prime minister. He was uh, prime minister immediately after the communist revolution because we had a Soviet Republic in Hungary and you even for three months, we had Romanian arm army in Budapest, which uh, nobody knows uh, in, the, in uh, our neighborhood and in the region. And uh, the Hungarian new government under Admiral Horty regime was extremely afraid that the situation will be repeated because uh, probably Ladislav Zabada is familiar that we had even Slovak Republic for a week or so uh, in 1919, Communist Republic. Uh, but uh, fortunately for us, the Soviet army didn't come to us. It was some 200 kilometers from uh, Slo uh, com contemporary Slovakia uh, and uh, the uh, territory of uh, Hungary. However, the Soviets were coming to, to Warsaw directly. And at that moment, Hungary uh, has decided to help as much as possible. So Paul Teleki is uh, regarded in our country as a kind of a national hero 
at least among the experts, because of course he is not known to every Polish citizen. And he repeated his position again uh, in uh, early September 1939, when Poland was invaded by Hitler, once again Hungarian government, and it was a heroic act, was against uh, the Hitler, against uh, the, the main ally, uh, and didn't allow the Wehrmacht, the German army, to invade Poland from the contemporary Slovak territory. And brought about, by the way, a very peculiar and very uh, nice part in Polish-Hungarian relationship known as the Polish refugees during the Second World War. So we had a very nice time during the war, but we had not so nice time prior to the war, because fortunately we have at least one source. Here is it a Hungarian version. Uh, Ondras Hori was the last uh, representative not necessarily uh, the um, ambassador, because there was no ambassadorial level, two or so. And uh, he wrote a memoir when Polish government was going out of the capital city and found itself in Hungary and Transylvania. Here is the Polish version recently published of the same book which is not only this memoir from September 1939. I don't know, Ladislav, it is, if it is known and available in Czech or Slovak, but it is extremely mm. important source for the Polish people. Uh, and in the Polish edition, we have also his di diplomatic uh, writings, starting from 1935 until the Second World War. And from his memoirs and from documents, we know that Trianon was a kind of taboo in Polish-Hungarian uh, relations between the wars during the Horty era, because Poland were benevolent of the uh, Versailles Treaty. We re-emerged on the map while uh, Hungary was the major victim of this uh, treaty. Only in early 1930s, Poland hesitantly subscribed and signed the Trianon Treaty uh, because we are... And Horty did come to Poland only in 1938 when Marshal Piłsudski was already... Uh, has passed away. So uh, we had a very nice formal relationship but uh, we had different allies because Hungary was allied with Germany uh, and, of course, uh, uh, central powers, while Poland was on the other side. And what is important when we are trying to come back to the national issues again today, always in Hungary, there will be a question of uh, Transylvania, while for Poland, it will be not a question of Transylvania, but Romania instead. Mm. As we know, those are not the same terms, and this is a problematic, and I hope we will have a chance to come back at the final round of our debate uh, to the issue, because Budapest has some imagination, at least the prime minister, uh, about the future. And the Polish government and the Polish leadership here in Warsaw has also uh, imagination, vision about the future, which is not necessarily the same one, even if we started to talk about the axis, so-called axis, <laughs> Budapest, Warsaw and Warsaw, Budapest, but I still do not know where the express train is going. <laughs> Maybe to Berlin, first of all, uh, as it seems to, uh, to be. Uh, but I don't want to dominate this uh, debate because Ladislav 
is waiting and waiting and soon will be a lady in waiting yes. so let's let's get him and we we'll have a Czech and former maybe former Czechoslovak perspective which is also extremely important thank you yes thank you so much so just shortly because we have a few minutes Miklos Hortis era as well as the very consequences of his signing the Treaty of Trianon were avoided throughout the entire period as I said this communist time in Hungary so Mr. Radislav Tabada what was the reason um, for this policy I'm just thinking maybe they did not they simply want to mention the great defeat? Uh, what was it mainly the desire to support maybe the Hungarian brothers throughout the Eastern Bloc? Uh, basic, basically, I, I would say that uh, the most important issue is that uh, uh, the Hungarian history of the 20th century is the typical Central European history of the nations and states that are uncertain and uh paul teleki was mentioned is he's, he's a very typical person and very typical sociotype uh for for this period of the first half of the 20th century and in, an intellectual that uh that was uh, fully aware how how problematic are are um, the events related with the with the first world war with with the with the uh, with the Results of the First World War, and of course, also uh, the the problem of revanchism and the problem of I would say just or justice in 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 the Central European politics. If you look into into his curriculum vitae, it's really symbolic. He was geographer, and he tried as as the as the as the Minister of Info, of, of Foreign Affairs and and Prime Minister to to bring uh, scientific arguments uh, how to avoid the Trianon Treaty, and he failed. And it was almost the, the end of his, of his political career in Hungary. And nevertheless, he came back in, 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 in the late 30s again. Uh, and what is very typical, uh, he was trying to balance between two great powers, the Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, uh, and he really lived in, 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 the, in, the, in the situation of geographic proximity we perfectly know in Central Europe. And he was trying to balance in the situation that didn't uh, offer any positive result. This, 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 this is something that we know from Poland perfectly. This is a lot of Ribbentrop Pact and the fourth division of Poland. We know it perfectly from, from the Czechoslovak, Czechoslovak perspective. This is the Munich Agreement and the, and the, the, the further development uh, with the so-called independent Slovak state and the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. And this is something that we know in the, in the fate of almost every Central European nation. Look at Slovenia, look at Romania, et, 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 et cetera, Baltic states, of course, and Baltic nations and so on. So. Uh, th this is not this is not black and white history, and this this is something that has to be that, that has to be reflected. Talking about the situation at the end of the Second World War and after the Second World War, and specifically talking about the Hungarian case and the Hungarian reflection of Trianon uh, catastrophe, uh, I would say that what we, what we could observe is is the paradigmatic jump or, or paradigmatic switch from na national uh, uh, prism or national paradigm towards new paradigm and this is the class paradigm. Uh, of course it is something that must be discussed in broader scope of development of East East Europe as the Soviet Soviet uh, regimes types Europe and of course, if we look into the Hungarian history, uh, we could observe the situation of the first post-war elections uh, where the Communist Party didn't won, and then the uh, direct Soviet, uh, Soviet uh, control over the Hungarian politics, and basically, as also in, in the Polish case, basically the implementation of a Soviet type regime in the country after 1946, 1947 in the, in the, in the Hungarian case. And of course, it is also, also somehow related with this, with this uh, 
abandonment or abandoning the issue of uh, central Europeanness as one type of identity. Uh, I would say that this is something that was very typical for the 1950s, which it means that the really black and white situation of West and East Europe, where there was not a place or the place didn't exist or any area existed for some open debate about, about the Central European identity and Central European region. Uh, by the way, Teleki was, was uh, the person that uh, promoted, promoted the cooperation of Central European nations and the establishment of some Danube Federation or Central European Federation, as it was the case of, of Milan Hoxha in the Slovak, in the in, in Slo Slovak environment, or as, as, it, as it was the case of, uh, for example, German-speaking poli politic political scientists and economists living in Brno in Moravia, like like Bauer and these these guys. So I would I would stress that uh, Teleki was trying to balance uh, somehow. After the after the Second World War and having Hungary in um, in the Soviet camp, there was no place for for open discussion about the uh, previous periods, as it was the case also in other nations. Just look into into Poland and missing missing uh, public debate debate about cutting, for example, in nineteen late nineteen forties nineteen fifties as it was the, the case of Czechoslovakia. By the way, the debate about the so-called Second Republic in the years 38-39, we still still do not have open debate about, about this period. And of course, it was also the case of Slovakia and the debate about the so-called independent Slovak state. Uh, so I would say it was very common for our nations. And what was also common was uh, that such debates were opened in, in the exile. Uh, in the Hungarian case, after 1956, uh, in the Hungarian-speaking exile, we could observe such debates, at least in the academic environment. Pierre Kende, for example, in, 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 in France, uh, is one, one of good examples. Uh, of course, such debates were also strongly influenced uh, by the situation that um, many of these this, uh, exile-located persons uh, were uh, the direct political participants in the processes in 1930s, 1940s. So their opinion was strongly influenced uh, by the, uh, I would say, war mentality from 1940s. So you, you could be friend or enemy, but nothing between. Uh, and this was also very typical, I would say, for, 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 for such debates. So also in the exile, such these open debates didn't... Uh, develop uh, in the way that I would I would uh, label as uh, open-minded, as ar well-argumented and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, and it is again not only the example of Hungary, but in Hungary and, and maybe the Polish case, the most visible is the, is the, is the debate in some epistemic communities in society or, or this, this si silent agreement with the issue uh, every, everyone knew about cutting in Poland, but it was not discussed publicly. Everyone knew about Trianon, or about, everyone knew about 1956 in Hungary, but nobody spoke about this issue publicly. And this is something that uh, we could we could all also observe in 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 in, uh, in historical memoirs, in some oral history documents, and so on that uh, basically from 1960s, uh, the debate about Hungarian modern history, including the Trianon issue, including the, the uh, Soviet dominance in, in, the, in the Eastern Europe, including the relations to the Hungarian minorities living in the, in the bordering countries like, like uh, Yugoslavia or more or less Serbia and Croatia, in this case, in Transylvania and Slovakia, uh they happened but were not publicized and uh in hungarian case we could uh, what what we could really observe is some uh institutionalization of such debates and institutionalization of such epistemic communities uh, very typical is, is 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 the group surrounding the the first post communist prime minister josef antal 
uh, that were, were uh, settled basically in, in, in some research institution focusing on the history of medicine where, uh, where, where uh, Joseph Antal was the, was the director, Geza Jesenski was part of this institute and so on. So we could observe in Hungary this very typical situation when these uh, dissidents were not fully excluded from the, from the society, were not fully excluded from the institutional life from 1960s and somehow positively used also the situation of this goulash communism uh, development in, 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 in the country. Mm. When it comes to cutting, in, um, it was also uh, a Soviet propaganda because few people just know that, uh, knew that it was uh, a Soviet uh, matter, not German. So it's quite difficult to talk about it uh, now. And maybe <laughs> when I'm thinking about it uh, and this great silence, uh, I believe that sometimes as maybe in our lives and with our problems, as perhaps in this case as well, uh, moving away from certain things, a momentary forgetfulness allows to heal wounds to look at history from a different uh, perspective in order to be able to look ahead. I, I agree with you, uh, talking, talking specifically about the Trinon. Of course, I, I have to add that during the communist period, it was um, created or prefabricated the rhetorics that uh, the Western allies allies are guilty, the, cap the bourgeoisie, the capitalist countries are uh, guilty for such catastrophe and uh, the only solution would be to organize the global communist revolution, which was also, there was an attempt in Hungary and it was also stressed uh, in, the in the Hungarian and not, no, not only Hungarian propaganda, there was an only one uh, attempt to prevent uh, the Trianon Agreement, and this this, this was the, this was the the Soviet Hungarian Republic in 1919. Of course, uh, I'm more skeptical. I, not only in the Czech, Czech or Slovak historiography, we discuss we discuss the issue if the Hungarian Soviet Republic was not not only another attempt how to protect uh, big Hungary. So uh, I would say the substitute nationalism. Uh, hidden in the in, uh, behind the class uh, rhetorics, but this 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 would be for, for I, I would say for another debate. Yeah. May I add something to this? Yes, yes. You just allow me. Your words. Okay, so words. there is there is a very nice example that uh, clearly uh, shows uh, uh, the the uh, social embed, embed, embeddedness of uh, of these ideas. There was a, a, a military a unit, uh, the so-called uh, CK division, uh, operated from 1918 until 1919. Uh, they tried to defend Transylvania from the invading Romanians without any government support or anything uh, on their own. So there was a social movement uh, which was uh, certainly uh, ideologically or politically also influenced, but not directly uh, influenced or directly uh, uh, ordered by any government in Hungary. Uh, this uh, unit actually uh, could not certainly uh, withstand uh, the, the invading Romanians in Transylvania, but uh, um, they, they successfully uh, slowed down uh, this process. Now, in uh, March 1919, uh, this division uh, was uh, uh, asked by the communist Hungarians, so at that time the communist coup already took place in Budapest, and the new communist government wanted them to uh, join the communist uh, uh, movement, and they refused. They refused, and actually, this was the moment when uh, the Romanians got uh, into the Tisza River because uh, th these guys there uh, simply said, "No way, no way. We are not communists. We don't, don't show. 
we, we, we will never join. And they surrendered, actually. At least half of uh, the team surrendered. They wanted to go back to Transylvania. But the other half uh, remained. And they, they uh, practically joined uh, the communist government, the Red Army. And it was exactly that unit uh, that was uh, uh, used uh, uh, by the Red Army in the uh, major uh, offensive uh, against uh, uh, the, the Czechoslovakian uh, army occupying the uh, other part of Hungary. You know uh, that uh, there was, a, I, I think it was a two weeks uh, uh, offensive uh, uh, and it was quite successful. They almost reached the uh, original uh, border to Poland and they wanted to join uh, the, the Soviet army, I mean the Red Army of the Soviet Union. This was uh, not successful, of course, but uh, uh, what I wanted to say was that uh, uh, the national feeling uh, of uh, the soldiers there made them uh, join even uh, the communist government in order to protect uh, the big Hungary, what uh, you have already mentioned. So it was, uh, in fact, not uh, only a, 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 a high-level government-led uh, or politicians-led uh, movement, it was a social movement. It was a social movement. And this is exactly what uh, the Hungarian communist government after, uh, after uh, Second World War, 1945, wanted to forget about. So they um, actually falsified the story and said that uh, uh, it was the Hungarian workers, labor, uh, uh, that uh, joined the Hungarian Red Army and successfully fought uh, against the uh, Czechoslovakian uh, troops. And this was a lie. It was not uh, the, the, the workers, not at all. The workers' units actually were absolutely useless because they were not disciplinized, you see. So the spearhead uh, of that offensive was the nationalist uh, Hungarian soldiers coming from Transylvania. But this was not the story that the communists wanted to hear after 1945. And this is exactly why also Trianon was forgotten about. Because uh, it, was, it was something uh, different that, uh, than what they wanted to hear. Uh. After the end of World War I and the message given by Woodrow Wilson in which he presented the famous 14 points regulate, among others, minority issues in Central Europe, many did not believe in the sense of existence and the strength of the newly created countries. However, the Prime Minister, later President of Czechoslovakia, Edward Benesch said after the signing of the Treaty of Trianon that one should look uh, to the future and not look back on the past tragedies, wars and suffering. Maybe for him it was easier, <laughs> but after more than 70 years, the Visegrad group was formed, an association of Poland, Czechoslovakia, former Czechoslovakia and Hungary, and in 1993, Czechoslovakia broke up, but the strength of both countries, as well as uh, of Hungary and Poland, is still significant today. And we cooperate in many aspects and areas uh, of political, cultural, and social life. And Mr. Miklos Sani, how did the post communist period affect? Uh, the economic situation of these countries. Has cooperation started to positively influence their development? What was the Central Europe's development model? Well, the uh, uh, communist regimes in these countries uh, uh, did a, a, a major structural uh, change uh, of the economies and uh, in certain periods there was a very robust economic growth and development but uh, it turned out 
that uh, the structures that were created uh, responded uh, to the logic of uh, central planning and served uh, the interests or the, the demand uh, of the Soviets and, uh, of, of course, uh, the, the uh, uh, regional demand as well. But uh, it was separated completely from the world market. So therefore, after the transition, uh, a completely new uh, uh, economic setup had to be uh, established. Um, this new era, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, was uh, dominated by the multinational companies uh, and uh, the control over uh, the activity of these firms is not so strong anymore. So they are much more independent than were uh, firms uh, any time in, in, in history. Uh, therefore, uh, it is uh, very difficult to uh, deal with uh, major uh, multinational companies who wanted to invest uh, in the Central European uh, economies. So this is uh, how uh, the uh, countries here uh, became very much dependent on uh, not just governments or other countries, but also the uh, multinational business. So the dependence uh, that we have already been talking about is uh, not just uh, uh, dependence from countries or governments, but uh, uh, the business, uh, multinational global business in general. This is a worldwide phenomenon actually, but those countries who are small, like Hungary, uh, uh, Slovakia, uh, also Czech Republic, a little bit less uh, Poland, they are more exposed uh, to the uh, negative impacts of this dependence. And what we see is really that, uh, well, uh, sometimes uh, uh, um, economic policy actions and development uh, is uh, favoring more uh, business interests than national interests. So uh, this clash of, uh, of uh, the uh, two types of uh, interests uh, is uh, clearly seen uh, in the region. And uh, despite of the fact that uh, many uh, positive impacts uh, were also witnessed, uh, the negative impacts are emphasized uh, uh, very frequently by those governments who would like to uh, look for uh, some kind of excuse because of the slowing down of economic development, because of the lacking uh, um, further development uh, uh, in, uh, in the region, in, the, in these economies. So sometimes uh, the anti-globalist uh, slogans uh, come to the surface and uh, uh, these are uh, mainly used uh, as a cover of uh, the disability or inability of, uh, of governments to uh, pursue uh, such economic policies that would bring more uh, benefits or, or would uh, uh, improve uh, uh, the economic and social uh, uh, situation and progress uh, in the Central European uh, economies. So uh, the situation is even more complicated because of the 2008 uh, crisis. So uh, obviously uh, after that crisis, as uh, uh, Professor Gruachik already has said, uh, the uh, previous pattern of uh, the organization of the world economy, the neoliberal uh, principles uh, uh, became uh, very much uh, debated and, uh, and blamed for the failure. And this is true, uh, actually. And uh, the uh, uh, national governments, national uh, policies uh, uh, became stronger everywhere in the world. So uh, what uh, President Trump uh, uh, has always emphasized uh, uh, is uh, also in this line. So it is not just our small countries uh, where uh, economic patriotism or economic nationalism uh, uh, gained uh, uh, momentum, but also big countries 
who feel that uh, are losers of the globalization process. Actually, I don't think uh, the United States is a major victim of globalization, but you, you, you can just see even the Americans, who were the most important winners of the process, feel that they uh, suffer from something. Okay, so for small countries like ours uh, in Central Europe, obviously this uh, sentiment uh, uh, can be even stronger. And this can be uh, used and misused politically uh, very badly. And this is what we see. Um, on the other hand, uh, I personally think that uh, the transition process and the economic development after the transition um, in 1990 was a success story uh, for Central European economies, for Central European societies. Um, and what we see today is uh, uh, giving up some of the uh, results, giving up of some of the benefits uh, of that process. So I'm uh, rather skeptical if uh, increased uh, economic nationalism would provide uh, new fruits uh, uh, in this uh, process. It is, it is more a uh, stepping back into, I don't know what, into a, a completely different uh, setting maybe uh, but uh, if uh, I, I can talk mainly about the Hungarian government's policies uh, because I'm more uh, familiar with that but uh, the Hungarian government uh, uh, did not certainly give up uh, the promotion of investments the promotion of multinational business in general uh, it still extends uh, very substantial and generous uh, subsidies uh, for new investments in certain branches, in certain economic branches, not everywhere. So the Hungarian government uh, uh, tries to uh, apply selective policies. This is in contrast with the neoliberal agenda because the neoliberal agenda said that uh, policies should not be selective, they should be normative. Uh, the selective policies uh, favor uh, manufacturing industries uh, and they favor, and here we can uh, start thinking about if the politics really influences uh, these decisions, I mean international politics, it is uh, mainly German uh, automotive and electronics uh, investments in Hungary that uh, receive uh, the bulk of the uh, Hungarian government's support. On the other hand, uh, uh, services, uh, for example, retail trade uh, or uh, financial services uh, receive uh, much less uh, support. Uh, on the contrary, I have already been talking about the anti-globalist slogans. Uh, they are blamed in an anti-globalist manner. Uh, and uh, behind some of these uh, uh, propaganda campaigns, I would say, we see the national interest. So the uh, Hungarian capital owners uh, who are maybe uh, also engaged uh, in close relations with uh, the, uh, some of the government uh, uh, members and, and the uh, ruling party, uh, the government would like to uh, remove uh, competition uh, and clear uh, the market for uh, those Hungarian firms that they would like to support. So the content of economic uh, patriotism or nationalism today in Hungary is very much bound to this uh, crony relationship with the business. So uh, what the government would like to protect uh, or where the government would like to limit uh, uh, competition are those markets where uh, the Hungarian capital owners uh, have uh, some strong positions. Elsewhere, for example, the automotive industry or electronics where Hungarian players are not on the scene, they continue, uh, uh, I mean the Hungarian government continues uh, the generous support of investments. And this also has a, an important economic impact. So, uh, I believe in competition, actually. So I don't think that without competition, effect, effective economy uh, can be developed. 
uh, if uh, uh, we uh, limit uh, uh, competition in certain branches, then the efficiency of those branches will mm. decline. Uh, if uh, these uh, branches uh, dominate the economy, then the whole economy will uh, decline. The efficiency, the productivity, the performance of the whole economy will suffer. But if uh, there are uh, other branches where uh, these tendencies do not uh, uh, unfold, uh, like manufacturing industry, then this uh, viable competitive part of the economy can uh, support, subsidize, so to say, on the macroeconomic level, uh, the uh, other part as well. So it is necessary to have a competitive, uh, internationally also competitive part. And this uh, part of the economy is still uh, dominated by multinational firms in Hungary. So this is uh, the a rational, a kind of rational, why the Hungarian government still supports some of the uh, multinational business, despite of the fact that they, at least uh, on the declarations, hate uh, globalization, hate global business, uh, but still uh, they have to uh, uh, make compromises. Yeah, you're right. And as you said, the cooperation began to have a multi-phase dimensions. But however, uh, the Visegrad Declaration mm, clearly spoke of a joint effort to cut off from the Eastern Bloc. So consequently, uh, going to the next topic, the main goal of uh, the Visegrad Group was the accession of these countries uh, to the European Union and NATO. So what did this road to the West look like, uh, Mr. Ladislaw Sabada? Yeah, I fully agree with you that this, is, this was one of the most important issues uh, discussed within the Visegrad 3 or Visegrad 4. Uh, I will focus only on Hungarian case, if you don't mind, uh, because uh, to discuss all four countries, we, we must go to the details yeah. and discuss such such very problematic periods like Machiarism in Slovakia and so on. And this was really limit uh, limit our debate and uh, and prolong uh, uh, extensively the discussion. So I will talk only on about the Hungarian case, maybe somehow framed with the Visegrad Visegrad group uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, I have to stress that Hungary and next to Hungary also Poland present some specific cases and we are talking about, about the late 1980s and about the openness towards, towards the West. Uh, and Hungary, Hungary was really the, I would say, the, the, the nation that uh, opened the gate towards the West. So already since 1987 we could observe important changes within the Hungarian internal policy policies, but also regarding the Hungarian foreign policies. So the government started to negotiate with the European community about some specific statute of, the, of, of, of Hungary vis-a-vis uh, -vis European community, uh, Hungary and later Poland uh, provoked the European community to prepare some specific pro program uh, of first help or first aid for such nations. It, this, this was the FARE program, including the P and H, as the as the first first uh, letters of, of of the names of, of of Poland and Hungary. And last but not least, I would like to stress the very specific issue, and this is the situation of you uh, uh, organization for for. Uh, cooperation and security in Europe based on the Helsinki process. Since 1986 to, to, to 89, there was organized the follow-up conference of OVC, of, of this confer, uh, organization in Vienna, and the uh, Austrian uh, foreign ministry, represented by Alois, Alois Mox, Mox really represented uh, very specific, very interested, and well-informed actor about what was happening behind the Iron Curtain specifically on the borders, which, which means Hungary, uh, Northern Yugoslavia, 
maybe Czechoslovakia and of course, of course Poland. Uh, talking about Hungary, I have to stress that the transition was relatively easy. It started, it started early. Uh, and it was organized more or less in the first phase as a, as a reform. So the social Hungarian Socialist Party transformed itself into the Western style Socialist Party. Uh, and only after this attempt, the opposition came, the unsatisfied opposition came uh, and asked for the debate, uh, for some roundtable discussions and ask to organize the real democratization and transition towards democracy, not only the reform. Uh, as regards the uh, European way, so I mean the, the way towards the European European Union, I have to stress that in the political science debate, we, we uh, label Hungary and next to Hungary also Slovenia as so-called brave pupils. So the nations that basically without big problems without big discussions without trying to uh, negotiate some specific profits uh, joined the european community and the european union which means that the hungarian government the hungarian parliament adopted the aki communitaire without any visible obstacles and also easily negotiated all chapters during the negotiation processes after 2001. It is uh, very different if we compare the situation of Poland, especially talking about the, the chapters uh, focusing on, on uh, agricultural issues, but not only this. And of course, uh, specifically, if we observe the situation of Czech Republic, Slovakia and, and Slovenia, this is the issue of so-called Venice decrease and Avnoi decrease. Open, open by Austria and and partly also by, by some some uh, federal units in in Germany, of course with Bavaria in the first place, and of course we we should also mention the problem of uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, I mean the problem uh, stressed by Austrian government. This was the nuclear power plant of Temelin in Czech Republic and also the nuclear power plants in Slovakia and, and again in Slovenia. So in this way, Hungary uh, seems to be a non-problematic case, I have to stress. We cannot uh, find uh, between the year 1989 to 2004, in these 15 years, any uh, critical moment, I would say, on this tra trajectory towards the European Union. Uh, if there might be observed some critical points in, in the negotiations between Brussels and P Warsaw or between Brussels and Prague or between Brussels and Bratislava, repeatedly, by the way, it, it was not the case of Hungary. Paradoxically, also the first government of Viktor Orban in the years 1998-2002 uh, softened the criticism towards the uh, West, basically, or, and, and towards the so-called Brussels. And it was exactly this government that uh, opened the majority of chapters in the negotiations and uh, somehow uh, continued uh, uh, in, in, the, in this non or on this non promotic trajectory towards the membership in the European, European Union. Uh, by the way, talking about the Visegrad perspective, Hungary was the nation that organized the referenda about the EU membership as the first nation because the support for the European, European Union membership was the, was the highest one, talking about the V4 nations. And there was some silent agreement that we should, we should continue from the nation that supports uh, the, the EU membership and at the end, there should be the nation where uh, the, the support is not as, as clear and uh, somehow also the positive development in Hungary uh, sh might be reflected by the, I mean, the Czech and Polish societies as a good example, which was also the case, in fact. Uh, of course, there, there were some problematic issues, but not critical points. One very important problematic issue is, of course, the, the question of relations of the Hungarian governments uh, to the Hungarian diaspora. This is especially, especially I have in mind the, the law about the double citizenship uh, implemented by the first Orban government, uh, 
which didn't, I would say, reflect the legal situation of the neighboring countries. Let me remind, uh, for example, that in Slovakia, we, we didn't have uh, the legal statute of double citizenship. Uh, and it caused some, some, I would say, problems in the Slovak-Hungarian and Romanian-Hungarian relations. Not as much in Hungarian-Serbian relations, has to be stressed too. Uh, of course, there were also some other problematic issues in bilateral uh, relations. I have, I have to stress the issue of Gabčíkovo, Nať Maroš, uh, uh, dam or system of dams on the Danube River. The Hungarian side decided uh, not to follow up the project from 1980s. Uh, and there were many, many, many international disputes about this issue. And of course, I have also to stress that the Hungarian uh, political actors, uh, usually in the pre-elections pre and election period, open some wounds, or uh, open some problematic issues, especially the issue of decrease. And when we, are, we were talking about some specific axes, Almost before every elections in Hungary, we could observe the specific axis, uh, Munich, Vienna, Budapest, uh, discussing again the issue of, of Bene, especially the issue of Benesh decrees. Uh, but uh, usually a few days or a few weeks after the elections, these re rhetoric stops. And uh, we also have good habit in Visegrad not to discuss as much the problematic issues, but to uh, prefer the the policies and the issues where we share the uh, opinion and we are able to find some common common uh, common position uh, two sentences to the nato nato membership of hungary only two sentences i promise of course problematic as regards the stra strategic issues hungary became the member of nato in 1999 uh, but Slovakia didn't join uh, the, the North Atlantic uh, Alliance, so Hungary was for a few years an island in uh, East, South or Southeastern Europe. Uh, I have to stress, I was one, one year teacher at the military academy in, in Budapest, uh, and I have to stress that uh, the Hung if there are some, some I would say, well-working institutions in our region, these are militaries paradoxically. And, uh, but again, Hungary was a special case. Uh, if we compare, compare with Poland and Czech, Czech Republic, in both nations, we could observe strong actors that preferred the NATO membership before the EU membership. It was not the case of Hungary. The EU membership was the primary goal. On the other side, Hungary became, uh, I would say, very active member of NATO. And uh, I would say that the Hungar Hungarian military and the security system uh, somehow included in into the NATO structure uh, is functioning uh, not perfectly, but I would say in very good, really westernized, westernized uh, institution, uh, which is also in my in my in my view, in my view very positive uh, development. Perfect. Thank you so much. So as we can see. Uh, the Visegrad group countries are developing relatively well uh, and facing very various tasks and challenges such as cooperation, as we said, uh, with China and the development of the new Silk Road. However, the economy is closely linked to the policy, which is very dynamic and, how to say, di diversified in our region recently. Poland and Hungary are moving in the nationalistic uh, direction, while the Czechs and Slovaks are deepening their cooperation uh, with, within the European Union. Uh, however, it's the Hungarian Prime Minister, uh, Viktor Orban, who is this spectacular, unusual and controversial uh, politician on the European arena. And, his current main propaganda tube uh, is the return to the great Hungary and the revisionism of the Tranon Treaty. So Mr. Bogdan Guralczyk, um, summarizing our uh, two debates about Tranon Treaty, can you 
um, say something more about your experience during August in Budapest and can you say something more about what is uh, Viktor Orban's political tactics and the system he created? First of all, I would like to take an optimistic note, which is necessary for us, especially during the time of pandemic, when we, we have still online connections, no direct uh, meetings, and we have a very popular term a uh, few years ago here in Poland, the twins, the twin term for pandemic, is of course a recession. Uh, so uh, we don't know yet what we can expect and we are talking during the time of uh, so-called martial law in Slovakia and Czech uh, Czechia. Uh, so this is difficult. But I share the view, optimistic view of uh, Miklos Sani that competition is undergoing. We are moving forward and getting stronger and ever stronger. And I'm also sharing his view that Hungary is not necessarily the first uh, because everyone is the first. Uh, this is uh, optimistic note number one. Optimistic note number two, that fortunately I am not a lawyer and legal expert because you will demand from me to explain what the hell this uh, new institute uh, of law between Budapest and Warsaw uh, is meaning, uh, so uh, this is for another debate and outside of us. Uh, and uh, to the issue and to the point, after the optimistic note, uh, in the contemporary world of uh, high technology <clears throat> and uh, artificial intelligence, the, m the most popular term probably is connectivity. So I will try to do utmost to connect uh, Visegrad 4, Trianon, and Central Europe term, and including Mr. Oban, because uh, the host is asking. Uh, first of all, uh, during the Horty era, which we just tried to describe a little bit during the previous session, uh, there was one foreign policy of the country and it was the revision of Trianon and it was not Miklos Horty but this person who was uh, the real statesman of Hungary uh, Istvan Betlen for 10 years prime minister and until the end of Horty era Horty era uh, let's remind 1920 1944, uh, Betlen was uh, chief, uh, if not an open advisor to uh, Admiral Horty. So we had revisionism and uh, Hungary uh, during the war uh, from the Axis received some of the territories. And uh, because of that, in 1947, in the Treaty of Paris, the contemporary border lines of Hungary were repeated. This is, uh, as we already mentioned, a tragedy for Hungarian, for Hungarian nation. Just one example, contemporary territory since Trianon for 100 years of Hungary is 93,000 square kilometers, while the territory given to Romania Transylvania is 103,000 kilometers, square kilometers. So Transylvania, which went to uh, Romania, was bigger than Hungary itself. So this is extremely sensitive for every Hungarian. I'm not Hungarian, but partially so. And uh, I understand what kind of pain it is. And after the Paris Treaty of 1947, uh, Trianon was a taboo, and what more? It was still a taboo after so-called change of the economic and political system after 1989, because we had so many tasks and uh, 
uh, aims and goals in front of all of us to change the political system, legal system, economic system, and only uh, in uh, 2010, a little bit earlier, Mr. Orban came back to the issue of Trianon. And what we have right now is not necessarily the few bright vision of Visegrad 4, because what I observe, we have a new initiatives. From the Polish side, the current uh, president of Poland, Mr. Duda, already in 2016 came out with the idea of a free seas initiative, connecting Baltic Sea, Adriatic Sea, and uh, Black Sea. This is an old interwar idea of Marshal Piłsudski in the, under the new umbrella, and is simultaneous to the Visegrad Four. While, on the other hand, uh, Prime Minister Orban, at least from 2010, when he has a, a constitutional majority in the in Hungarian parliament, is coming to some other ideas. And uh, uh, he not only has given uh, double citizenship, which was mentioned, uh, to the diaspora, uh, he has not only created the 4th of June, the Treaty of Trianon, as a national day. He is not only giving some stipends and uh, some social uh, equivalent to the diaspora coming to Hungarian territory, but at least, at least in this year, 2020, he came out twice with something new. Here I will name the city the city name, which is probably unpronounceable for non-Hungarians, Shator Oya Uihei, which is uh, to translate it, um, the new town under the tent. Uh, he came out uh, on the 6th of June this year with uh, his programmatic uh, speech. Uh, and this is a vision of great Hungary. Let's make Hungary great again which was repeated on uh, August 20, St. Stephen's Day, uh, in front of the parliament building, when the special monument was created, uh, according to the map prior to the First World War. St. Crown, St. Stephen Crown, is in front of the Hungarian parliament, and Hungarian settlers, Hungarian mountaineers inside of Transylvania, much closer to Bucharest than Budapest, uh, their flag is also shining on the fronton of the parliament building. So we have the same story again, revision, revisionism, uh, how to revise the uh, situation. This is uh, a new uh, story, a new chapter, and not, not necessarily shared by Slovaks, Czechs, uh, not uh, is speaking, not is even speaking about Romanians. Uh, so we need to be careful. And I already mentioned at the beginning of our first debate today that uh, we had this, uh, we have uh, American uh, president elections. It will be not the same America if Mr. Trump will win again, of Mr. or Mr. Biden will be a president of America. Because this is our main security alliance, uh, an ally America. And uh, Trump has changed the world. We have, and we had, and we observe also in our, on our domestic scenes here in Central Europe, division lines liberal versus non-liberals, to such an extent that Mr. Soros Free University went out and Fudan University from Shanghai is coming in to Budapest. So this is serious. This is not a joke. 
I was starting on the optimistic note, but now I am uh, starting to think where we are going and where are moving on. And uh, Mr. Trump has changed uh, the values into the interests. We have power politics again. And when Mr. Sani, I am coming back, uh, coming to my close uh, uh, closing remark, mentioned this uh, uh, communist army fighting with uh, Czechs and Slovak's army in 1919. It was not decision of Bill Lakun or the Hungarian Communist Republic. It was the decision of George Clemenceau, who asked the Hungarian and communists to stop the invasion. So I mentioned, and I'm repeating it again, they were sitting in the bus, not in the car, and not necessarily we are the drivers. We in small and medium countries of Central Europe, by the way, we mentioned Middle Europa, we mentioned Visegrad 4, but we need to mention also St. Stephen's St. Crown territory of Hungary. We need to uh, remember about Intermarium and Free Seas in Initiative because this is on the top of our agenda. So we have interests again among us and we need to be careful. And this is a very important moment, not only that we are under the pandemic, and we are far away from each other and talking only to the microphone and camera because serious interests are moving on and we don't know yet where is the final stop of our bus excursion. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, dear Mr. Bogdan Gracie, maybe this Trianon and its spirit still hovers over Central Europe and has tightened relations with it and we should closely I think observe as you said the formation of today's logic of history and we will see its effects in several maybe dozen years. Okay thank you very much for participating in this very interesting debate. Uh, we have just concluded talks on the Treaty of Trianon during which we were able to um, discuss the causes and effects of signing it, various problems arising mainly from national and ethnic backgrounds and its impact on the current policy of Hungary and the Visegrad group. Our subscribers and followers are invited to watch our other debates on YouTube, visit our website and follow our Facebook page fun page. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Naskledano visont latashro. Naskledano.